Welcome to my transparent watercolor tutorial, Floral Burst. The photograph on the right was the only reference used for this painting, and it was just used to get the general shape and structure of the flower. I begin with a very simple sketch of a few of the flowers and few leaf shapes. Most of the composition will be developed through my painting process. I begin my painting by applying a loose foundation wash on dry paper. This will become my color roadmap for my painting. I'm applying sap green and I'm working around the white areas that I want to preserve. I'm working on about a 20 degree incline so I let gravity do some of the work. And I'm not going to use any masking fluid for this painting. All my uh, whites will be preserved by painting around uh, the spaces that I want to uh, keep white or light. I've started with sap green and I've also put in a few touches of quinacrine and gold in a few spots. Now I'm coming in with mauve which is a nice violet tone and I'm placing these colors in various areas around the composition because I don't want it just to be ice the colors be isolated in one spot and the next color I'm going to bring in here is quinacrine and coral and I put these down, make these brush marks and then I'll come in with a fine mist spray bottle and I'll soften these edges, I'll diffuse the color and start to create some directional flow that I'll build on as I develop my composition in my painting process. When I develop a painting like this if you've seen some of my other videos I've mentioned before that I like to develop the composition as a whole. I don't just paint a flower and then stick in a background. I develop the whole composition. And I start with larger shapes, larger brushes, lighter values. And then I start working towards uh, smaller shapes, darker values, more detail, start using smaller brushes. I've been applying these washes with a silver black velvet brush, jumbo round small which is a nice wash brush. I actually could be working with a larger brush here, um, but it's not still not a tiny brush. It's a nice wash brush. A lot of times when I'm applying a wash like this, I'll apply it with a one and a half inch uh, kind of a paddle, short handle paddle uh, wash brush. Right now I'm working on a quarter sheet of Lanacora watercolor paper. So it's a, uh, not a huge painting, it's 11 inches by 15 inches. I'll dry this foundation wash and then I'll start doing some direct painting. Here I've started to do some direct painting and I'm using a mixture of sap green and pyrrole red. The pyrrole red neutralizes the green just a little bit and the mixture is at a middle value right now, middle to a middle dark value. And I'm just making some small brush marks around some of the larger flower shapes to start to give them a little bit more definition and you can start to see where the, the positive flower shapes are going to be versus the, the negative space in the background areas that's around the flowers. Often as I start to build my values and start to get smaller shapes, start to get more detailed, I'll start to, to work some of the detail first in the area that's going to be my center of interest. Although right now I've been working pretty much all around the composition, little by little I'll start to develop that area that will eventually become more my center of interest and that's going to be that top right corner. I always pretty much use the rule of thirds when I'm trying to pick an area to be my center of interest and there's a lot of material out there uh, on the internet on the rule of thirds and I also have a video on my uh, home page on YouTube where I discuss the, the uh, rule of thirds in a quick tip. You'll notice that a lot of the direct painting that I do, the kind of the detail work that I'll do in this painting and when I do similar paintings like this I like to use this quill brush uh, that uh, has a nice point, holds a lot of paint but it has a nice point and uh, it's a 
very inexpensive brush. They're a little hard to find. If you go to the studio page on my website, I have this listed with all my other brushes, but it's a brush that I use a lot when I'm doing these types of paintings to do some of this small uh, shape brush work that I do. If you've seen some of my other videos, you know that I like to use a fine mist spray and I really like the diffused color, the effect that it has in diffusing the color and creating a flow with the paint. And you can see here, I'm doing that with this mauve tone that I'm applying. And uh, it's just a technique that I really like. And throughout my painting process, as I develop this painting, I'll put down some brush marks of tone that I'll, uh, I may soften it with just a brush with water or I may soften it with my spray bottle. But I'll build these layers and when the surface gets to where I can't make the brush marks that I want, then I'll stop and I'll dry it with a hair dryer. So I do a lot of studio painting in my studio. I frequently use a hair dryer and I use it many, many times through the course of doing a painting. In the beginning, I mentioned that that initial wash becomes my color roadmap. And you'll notice as I apply these darker values, uh, not always, but for the most part, the, the darker value matches the initial foundation wash that I put down. This uh, darker value quinacrid and coral, which is uh, has just a touch of royal blue in it to make a little deeper uh, value. It's being applied over an area that had the initial quinacridone and coral wash. Now there are areas where I'll work in other uh, colors than what was in the foundation wash as I develop this, but a good uh, percentage of the direct painting I do matches the color that was in my initial wash. Now I'm going to put down just a little bit of quinacrid and coral here and I'm going to come in with a uh, fine mist spray and I really like the result of the uh, diffusion that you get after you hit this color with the spray bottle. I, I like that um, it's kind of a nice rich tone that you get and a nice diffused color that I think really draws you in uh, and that's the quinacrid and coral. And really, the main colors that I'm working with for this painting are quinacrid and coral, alizarin crimson, uh, mauve, and sap green. And then I use a little bit of royal blue to give me some darker values. And I use pyrrole red to neutralize the green just a little bit. And I did have just a touch of quinacrid and gold, but not very much. I like to use some of these stylized leafy shapes in my paintings like this and I kind of imagine them as I go along and every now and then I'll stop, dry my paper and I'll make some pencil marks just to give me an indication of where I might like some. So I do a combination of that where I'll make some pencil marks or I just uh, envision them as I go and uh, little by little I start to carve those shapes from the background and I start to build my values and start to build some depth in the composition, start to send some areas back and bring other areas forward. Another objective of mine when I'm doing a painting like this is to have hard edges, soft edges, and lost and found edges. And if you want to hear me talk more about um, hard edges, soft edges, lost and found edges, I have a beginning watercolor tip video on that subject. Here I'm going to use the technique where I put down some uh, paint, in this case mauve, with my brush then come in with a fine mist spray and diffuse that color. And I'm going to do this in this area just to give the suggestion that there could be some uh, more flower, uh, flower shapes a little bit farther back. So I put the, those brush marks down and diffused that, but I left some areas of white that can give the suggestion that there's some flowers back there. And you don't develop the, uh, the painting the same everywhere on the page. Some areas are going to be left for the viewer to make some decisions on what they're looking at, and other areas are going to be more defined 
and in particular the area around your center of interest you want to have more definition you want to have your greatest value contrast uh, in that area now I'm coming in with my quilt brush and I've got still a deeper valued green and to get that dark valued green I've taken my sap green I've mixed it with some pyrrole red and then I've mixed it also with some royal blue to make it a darker value green. As I go through my painting process and develop the painting uh, and I start to build my values, I'm always looking for areas where I can make shapes come forward or shapes go back, create overlap, create depth, and build areas of interest in my painting. This isn't something where I'm looking at a photograph uh, for reference, these are things that I'm developing just based on design principles. I'm trying to vary my shapes, I'm trying to vary my values, I try to create direction. There's some repetition going on with the foliage. Here I've switched back to a middle value sap green and I'm starting to define a few more leaf shapes and give some more definition to the flower shape there by putting that green wash behind it. Here I'm starting to paint some uh, leafy shapes up in this area of the composition towards the top. And here I'm still using my uh, quill brush and I'm painting wet on dry. Once again, I'm laying down some uh, areas of quinacridone and coral that I'm going to diffuse with the fine mist spray. I'll do this several times in, in this painting. You can see how that uh, quinacridone and coral and a little bit of mauve that I put there how it starts to send that flower shape forward so I'm going to do a little bit of the same on this other flower and that's quinacridone and coral going over top some mauve so it's a little darker value but again taking the fine mist spray and diffusing that color a little bit by applying these uh, small areas of color and then diffusing them with a fine mist spray it starts to tie certain areas together even though it's a very soft edge it's a it's a nice glazing effect that helps um, solidify some larger shapes even though they're soft edge and it sends those uh, flower shapes um, forward and makes them more pronounced just by um, painting in the background One of the things I like to do is I'll come in with a damp brush. This is a uh, nylon brush that's just uh, moist. And I'll come in and I'll make some linear marks. They help to build some direction and they create some areas of interest in the painting. And I use them as a reference point as I start to do some direct painting and build my values. I'll paint uh, on the edges of them. I'll make the suggestion that things are going under them or over them and uh, it's just, just a nice way to give you some ideas on where you can uh, enhance some of your shape making. Now some of the brush marks I'm making and some of the color that I'm going to diffuse here is uh, a fairly strong color and I'm going to do as I've been doing I'll come in with my fine mist spray bottle and I'll diffuse this color and I think this is hard sometimes for people to do because they're painting over top of an area that they've painted previously and they're afraid that they're gonna ruin it but uh, it's the, the beauty of this transparent watercolor and painting in the transparent manner is those nuances of your underpainting will come through and uh, 
I've got a, some pretty rich color that I'm putting down here. You don't really uh, can't see the full effect yet, but as soon as I hit this with a fine mist spray, you'll see this kind of rich tone gradate and diffuse, and uh, it, it has a very nice effect. And this is alizarin crimson, quinacridone and coral, and a little bit of royal blue. So it's kind of a deep, rich red tone that I'm applying. And then uh, it really has a nice effect when you spray and diffuse that color out. So as I uh, continue through my painting process and I've been building my values, you can see that I have many areas of white uh, left where I've saved the paper. Even though I've been doing some bold loose washes and I'm not using any masking fluid, I can still uh, preserve the white in the areas that I want to. And one of, the, one of the reasons I can do that is because I'm working on an incline and I'm working with gravity and I'm using the bead of the watercolor, I have uh, control of what's happening with that paint. If I were working flat and applying uh, wet fluid washes, it would be very uh, unpredictable on what was going to happen with that paint. But working on an incline, uh, you, you have control of what's going on on your medium. Now some of these areas where the paint runs, I'll go back in and I'll lift it up or I'll hit it with a Kleenex and I still have plenty of time to remove some of this if I want to. It's a very wet wash at this point. And uh, I'll pick up some of those puddles to prevent backwash and then I'll come in with a hair dryer and I'll dry this. Now I want to give a little bit of definition and structure to the flower shapes. So I'm coming in with a mixture of uh, sap green and pyrrole red. And I've got it uh, a ratio so that it's leaning towards the warm pyrrole red side. But it's almost a, a gold-like tone that I'm getting. Um, but it's just a mixture of sap green and pyrrole red. I use those two colors quite a bit and you can do a lot more than just paint green trees and uh, red flowers with them. They, they really make some nice neutrals. So as I work on this painting, I've really used three red tones um, so far, and that's um, probably all I'm going to use in this painting. And so those are quinacridone and coral, alizarin crimson, and my alizarin crimson is actually alizarin crimson quinacridone, so it's more light fast. And uh, then I've used pyrrole red. The quinacridone and coral and alizarin are used in areas where I want to have a red tone in my painting. And the pyrrole red is, uh, for the most part, just used to uh, help neutralize the sap green. So on this flower, I've been using the, the warm tone that I mixed with the sap green and the pyro red. And now I've got just a little bit of that mauve uh, with uh, some water in it to dilute it and make it a lighter shade. But it gives me a little bit of a cooler tone underneath some of these pet uh, flower petals. Yeah, I like mauve. I, I don't use it that often, but uh, I do work it into some of my florals and it's a nice uh, color and it really is uh, pretty much straight from the palette. I don't really mix anything in with it. It's a, it's a nice violet tone on its own. Here I'm doing some similar brushwork on this other flower shape. This is the uh, sap green and pyrrole red mixture. And I'm going to take just a little bit of um, a darker value red. And this is the alizarin crimson. And just give a few small touches of color 
in these areas to make it feel a little deeper uh, in the center of that flower and kind of highlight the, the area in the center of that flower. Now I'm going to start working with some darker values. So I'll have uh, a uh, mixture of the mauve that's uh, much thicker uh, with pigment than uh, the, uh, the other areas that I've done so far. So I don't have a lot of water. It's a very uh, rich in pigment and it makes a very nice value, dark value. So I'm going to start working around my composition and start to uh, put little dark value marks and start to bring in some detail and start to send some areas back uh, build depth in my composition and in particular I'm going to do some of this around my center of interest I'm continuing to put some of these dark value marks in and now I want to um, diffuse some other areas of strong color to keep bringing out um, some areas in the painting and send other areas back by uh, using darker values. So the, this tone that I'm putting down right now is a pretty rich mixture of quinacridone and coral. It's actually pure quinacridone and coral. And I'll take my uh, fine mist spray and diffuse that color down. And I'm just hitting it lightly. I'm going to do a little bit more. So I put this this wash on the edge of a of a leafy shape or a series of leaf shapes. And it starts to send larger areas of the background back and helps start to group some of these leafy shapes together to make larger, lighter shapes. And you can see some of those leaf shapes just blend right one and right into the other without any uh, line or change in value to break them up and separate them. That's some of that lost edge effect. So as this develops, you can see that there's specific areas where I have hard edges. You can see a lot of other areas where there's a lot of soft edge gradation. And you can see where some edges just disappear and shapes just disappear one into the other. I think lost and soft edges can sometimes be something that people struggle with because it goes against our nature. We want to fully define things and we like to draw lines around things and uh, sometimes it just doesn't feel natural to leave an area uh, without an edge or let it blend into another shape and just disappear. We, Like I said, we like to put lines completely around things. I continue to uh, work on darker values and put in some more detail and further define uh, smaller and smaller shapes. And it takes a while to do all this brushwork and uh, I go back and forth between the main colors that I'm using that being the, the green, the red, and the mauve. Now here I've decided I want to take some of those darker values up into the uh, top right corner and I'm going to, I have some of those carrying off the edge of the page and when I make my brush marks I I try to break up uh, a shape as I make it uh, when I make some of these linear marks and um, if I have a, a small area that I want to make a shape in a lot of times I'll break that shape in a multiple uh, elements and just make it more interesting and as I make these brush marks I try not to make them the same 
in terms of length and width. I try to vary that. So if I have a linear mark that I want to make uh, somewhere in my composition, let's say it's a it's a two inch long linear mark. I'm probably going to make that that uh, suggestion of that linear mark with multiple marks. In other words, that two inch line might be a a little line that's three quarters of an inch. Another one it's a half. Another one that's a an inch. And just vary those uh, linear marks. It helps create interest in um, gives variation. You can see that I've done quite a bit of uh, small shape dark valued brushwork and now I'm bringing in uh, a very rich tone uh, richer than the ones I've used so far and this is alizarin with some royal blue in it and I'm going to diffuse that with a fine mist spray and it's uh, really going to start to separate that area from the flower and make it go back farther and make that flower come forward. So as I paint I've done this a number of times and um, when you first put your paint down and it's wet it's much darker than what it will be when it's once it's dried and sometimes you think something's very deep and rich and dark and after you've dried it it's uh, lost 30 percent of that that value and uh, so you need to be aware of that and as you paint you um, go back in and and do it again until you get the value that you're really after Sometimes people say, why do you use the spray bottle instead of a brush to diffuse that color? And um, I do both, and it depends on the uh, result that I'm after. This, uh, you can get a nice diffuse, gradated color or value uh, just by using a brush and adding more water and, and working it down. And, uh, but there's just a nice quality that I like about the spray also and uh, that I don't feel you can get with just a, a a brush. It has this just nice diffuse effect that I really like. And so I, I use the spray bottle often because it gives me the result I'm after. I've got my wash brush and I'm doing some glazing around the edge of the flower shape to, to help make it uh, a little bit more defined. Next, I'm going to do the same, um, but with a green tone. I'm putting a wash over top of this area, and I'm using my um, uh, round jumbo round small wash brush that I was using when I started my painting. And I'm just being very generous with my wash and putting it around the edge of that flower, which is again that helps send that forward and push the area around the outside back. Here I've got a nylon flat brush that I like to use. Uh, it's an angled brush and I'm doing some more of this uh, lifting off making some linear marks and I like to drag that damp brush over top a darker value and what it does is it draws that dark pigment into the lighter area and makes a darker valued mark. I think these linear marks help uh, bring some activity into the composition help give some direction to the composition 
and I do this frequently. If you've seen some of my videos of, of a similar florals, I'll take this uh, approach where I'll do some lifting and dragging a pigment with a damp brush, and then I'll come in and finish it by taking a, a small liner brush with a dark value and making some more uh, linear marks, but with a dark value uh, uh, using a liner brush. And here now I've got my liner brush and I've got a dark value uh, red tone and this is a mixture of alizarin crimson with a little royal blue and I'm making some of these dark linear marks. When I make these marks I try to use them in a way that I can help move the viewer's eye around the composition so I'll uh, make some of these marks just as that one and I'll kind of bring them, hook them back uh, to help lead the eye around the composition. And that's my painting, Floral Burst, which focuses on negative painting. I hope you enjoyed watching. I recently launched a Facebook group called Rick Swartz Watercolor Friends and Subscribers in support of my YouTube channel. If you want to learn more, you can search for this group on Facebook. If you have specific questions about my supplies, you can go to the studio page on my website, rsowitzart.com, where I list all my supplies and equipment. If you have specific questions for me, you can email me at contactrsowitzart at gmail.com. You can follow me on Facebook. If you enjoyed this, don't forget to like it, share it, and comment. Thanks for watching.